And because we are starting late, I'm going to submit my full statement for the record, but I would just like to make a few comments at the outset. The first thing I would like to do is to recognize my ranking member, Senator Moran, um, for the great work that we have done together over the years, um, both when he was chair and I was ranking, and now that I'm chair and he is ranking, um, we have worked in a collaborative, bipartisan manner that I think has been good for this committee and good for the Senate. Um, I would also, and for the country, thank you, Senator Manchin. Um, I would also like to point out that this is um, the anniversary of a hearing we did a year ago with um, the FBI Director Ray that was right after the Uvalde shooting. And this is the day after the tragic um, school shooting in Nashville. I'm like everyone in the country, I'm sure I'm disappointed and saddened that once again, we're discussing the aftermath of another school shooting tragedy. We need to take action, and I think at some point we need to ask ourselves if giving more firearms to people is the answer to making us safer, because so far it's made us less safe, not safer. So obviously we have a lot of work to do, and I know that the budget that um, the Attorney General is going to talk about today um, makes significant investments in safer communities, the legislation that we passed last year that I think is very important. Um, I also wanted to point out that this budget makes significant investments in addressing the substance misuse crisis that we still have in this country. Um, it's a huge issue in my home state of New Hampshire, um, the increasing availability and pervasiveness of fentanyl is something that we've got to figure out how we better address um, in order to get ahead of this crisis. And I'm pleased to see the investments in the budget in addressing that and looking forward to hearing what more we can do. The other thing I wanted to just point out in terms of our ability to work together is that we have new leadership in both the House and Senate Appropriations Committees. Um, they have given us a very aggressive schedule and said that we are going to return to regular order. We are going to go through the bills and bring them to the floor. I think that's good news, and I would like to thank Ranking Member Collins, who is here today, who is um, the other half of the leadership of the Appropriations Committee, and also recognize that we have two um, new leaders in the House as well, and I'm, I am hopeful because all four of them are women. So we expect a, a new approach, right, Senator Moran? Uh, I'm the one who mentioned that uh, yes. when you didn't. Uh, yes, earlier, earlier thank today. you. I, I thought I'd beat you to it you today. Um, so we obviously have a lot of work to do, and we look forward to beginning this process. I will now turn it over to Ranking Member Moran. Chairman, thank you very much uh, for convening this meeting. Thank you for your cooperation. I intend to forego my opening statement to get us back on track with the voting schedule that we're, we've encountered again this afternoon. But I would uh, echo your comments uh, in which you indicate the desire and evidence that we fulfill that desire on most instances of you and I working together and this committee working in a, in a nonpartisan way, a bipartisan way to get a result. And I appreciate your uh, compliments of Senator Collins and Senator Murray, uh, the vice chairman and the chairman of the full committee. Uh, I'm anxious for uh, us to, to have a, a number in which you and I and this committee can begin uh, determining some uh, important uh, answers to some significant questions about uh, the funding of the agencies and departments uh, under the jurisdiction of the subcommittee. And I, again, thank you for your cooperation. Look forward to us uh, successfully reaching a, a satisfactory result. Thank you very much. Um, I will now ask the Attorney General if he would like to testify. Yes, uh, thank you, Senator. Before I begin, I do want to express my condolences to the families uh, uh, and loved ones of the victims in Nashville uh, for this horror, just hor horrific school shooting. 
Um, I also want to express my uh, condolences to, specifically to Senator uh, Haggerty, uh, who was on this uh, subcommittee, and I knew you no know, flew back to Nashville uh, to be with the community at the time. Um, we have both ATF and FBI resources uh, working hand in hand with the state and local uh, police uh, right now, and they will continue to do so um, um, uh, as long as is necessary. And the Justice Department will do everything that we have within our power to try to prevent uh, these kinds of really horrific shootings. Um, with that said, I, I want uh, to thank um, uh, the chairman, the ranking member, uh, and distinguished members of the subcommittee for the opportunity uh, to speak to you today. Um, this is for our uh, funding request for fiscal year 2024. Every day, the Justice Department works to keep our country safe from all threats, foreign and domestic. We work to protect the civil rights of everyone in the country. And every day, in everything we do, we work to uphold the rule of law that is the foundation of our system of government. The Justice Department's budget request seeks the resources we need to continue and to build on that work. To help keep our country safe, we are asking for more than $21.3 billion to sustain and expand the capabilities of the FBI, DEA, ATF, U.S. Marshals Service, and of our 94 U.S. Attorney's Offices. These resources will help protect communities across the country. They will strengthen our efforts to counter threats posed by hostile nation states, specifically the governments of the People's Republic of China, Russia, Iran, and North Korea. They will enable us to counter foreign and domestic terrorism and they will sustain and expand our whole of department approach to combating violent crime, the epidemic of gun violence, and the scourge of drug trafficking. The department is also seeking $2.7 billion for our Office of Community-Oriented Policing Services, our COPS Office hiring program. This funding will enable us to help our state and local law enforcement agency partners hire more full-time law enforcement professionals. As part of our efforts to disrupt drug trafficking, our budget requests $3.3 billion for DEA's investigations, diversion control, and counter drug efforts across 241 domestic offices and 92 offices in 69 countries around the world. The department is focused on getting fentanyl out of our communities and combating the violent cartels that are putting it there. Just last week, DEA issued an alert warning about the emerging threat posed by the deadly combination of fentanyl and xylazine, which increases the risk of fatal drug poisoning. We also know that addressing the proliferation of deadly drugs requires more than just enforcement actions. So we are requesting more than $646 million for grants to help address the drug overdose epidemic and the public health challenges of addiction and drug use. The department's budget also requests significant investments in our effort to combat economic crimes, protect the health, safety, and financial security of American consumers, and safeguard competition. This includes a, a $770 million request for our U.S. Attorney's offices to pursue investigations and prosecutions of complex economic crimes. These include COVID-19 pandemic fraud schemes that have exploited the pandemic and stolen millions of taxpayer dollars. Protecting civil rights was a fine founding purpose of the Justice Department in 1870, and it remains our urgent challenge today. The department's budget requests significant investments to advance that work. This includes our efforts to protect voting rights, combat hate crimes, foster trust and accountability in law enforcement, defend federally protected reproductive rights, advance environmental justice, and tackle the climate crisis. Specifically, we are requesting a total of $251.6 million for the Civil Rights Division, an increase of more than 32% to carry out its important mission. We are also requesting $127.6 million to support the FBI's investigations of civil rights violations. Administering just and efficient immigration courts and correctional systems is another important area of departmental focus for which we are requesting additional resources. We are requesting $1.46 billion, a 69.2% increase for the Executive Office of Immigration Review to hire nearly 1,000 new staff. This includes 150 new immigration judges. 
These resources will support our efforts to apply the immigration laws justly and efficiently. We are also seeking $8.82 billion in funding for the Bureau of Prisons. These resources will help ensure the health, safety, and well-being of correctional staff and incarcerated individuals. They will help ensure transparency, accountability, and effective oversight of all federal prisons and detention centers, and they will enable the department to fully implement the provisions of the First Step Act and increase programming to prepare individuals in federal prisons for successful reentry. I am extremely proud of the work the department's employees are doing to uphold the rule of law, to keep our country safe, and to protect civil rights. I re respectively ask for your support for the President's FY 2024 budget request so that we may continue and build upon that request. Thank you. Thank you very much. One of the concerns that I have about the budget process this year is just um, trying to ensure that we have some agreement between the House and Senate. And I have been troubled by some of the proposed cuts that I've heard from <coughs> the House leadership. Can you give this subcommittee any real life examples of the ways in which the cuts that have been um, suggested by the House leadership would affect the Justice Department and impact our families and communities? Uh, well, we were uh, specifically asked to address, um, uh, 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 Member DeLauro asked for us to address the consequences of a 22% cut. I'm not sure if that's the one you're suggesting, yes. but that's the one that we have addressed and we responded with a letter. But uh, the, the bottom line, it would be just devastating to the Justice Department. It would lead to a, a loss of more than $8 billion in our annual funding. For the FBI, it would mean a loss of 11,000 positions and a loss of non-personnel costs of about $1 billion. For the ATF, it would lead to a loss of 190 agents and 113 industry operations investigators. It would elim eliminate all state and local training at the National Center for Explosives Training and Research and it would increase the amount of time necessary to trace crime guns by greater than two months. For the Marshal Service, it would lead to our inability to replace about 221 deputy U.S. Marshals who are expected to leave by attrition in any particular year. It would slash the programs that we now have for the Violence Against Women's Act. They would not be able to be with, uh, funded without reductions in other grant areas. For the COPS program, it would mean that we would not be able to to provide funding for 300 to 400 law enforcement fun funded positions, so it would be 300 to 400 fewer positions. For the Office of Justice programs, it would lead to a $650 million loss in OJP's annual appropriations. For the burn JAG formula grants to local governments, it would reduce those grants to local governments by about $30,000 each. For state awards under burn JAG, it would mean a $1 million loss of funds to each state. Uh, the DNA backlog reduction program would lose $245,000 per award. Um, the U.S. Attorney's offices, 28% reduction uh, of the workforce in a single year. For the DEA, $620 million in reductions to base resources. <clears throat> and it would really devastate everything we've done to build up our cybersecurity over the last two years. So do you think it's a fair statement to say if we s experience those kinds of cuts with the Justice Department that it would have a real negative impact on our ability in communities to keep people safe and um, uphold the law? Exactly right. That is exactly the consequence. Thank you. Um, last week, the Department of Justice Office of Inspector General released its review of the Federal Bureau of Prisons' response to the COVID-19 pandemic. I'm sure it comes as no surprise that the report found that the pandemic exacerbated um, existing staff shortages at the Bureau of Prisons. It's a, an issue that we have seen at FCI Berlin in New Hampshire, um, which has been identified as one of seven institutions with chronic hiring challenges. I appreciate um, the department's continued effort to help us with retention incentives, but can you describe what else the department is doing to help address the shortages at the Bureau of Prisons? Yeah, well, you're definitely right. The uh, 
pandemic had a devastating effect on our workforce and on the conditions under which they were working and therefore had difficult problems with respect to retention. Uh, the, the budget that we're asking for here um, uh, requests uh, uh, sufficient funding for us to hire 2,250 new staff between FY23 and the end of FY24. That includes a new program of $109 million for hiring and retention incentives. We've worked out a deal with Office of Personnel Management to allow us to do this, um, and we are hopeful that that $109 million will help us um, in the quite difficult uh, area that we've had with respect to retention and hiring. Um, uh, right now, we have about 86% of authorized positions filled. Thank you. Um, let me just recognize the chair of the Appropriations Committee, Senator Murray, who has joined us. I recognized your um, vice chair, um, Senator Collins, earlier, so we're delighted to have both of you here for this hearing. And I will now turn it over to Ranking Member Moran. Uh, Chairwoman, thank you very much. Um, Attorney General, um, I'm a member, as is Senator Collins, of the Senate Select Committee. Uh, Committee on Intelligence. Uh, we've been trying from, uh, for a number of weeks to get information from ODNI uh, related to uh, the classified documents in the presence or in the uh, location of uh, the presence of the former vice president, the former president, and the current president. According to ODNI, the Department of Justice is blocking them from providing the committee access to these documents. And the explanation is there's an appointment of a special counsel or the belief that it would otherwise compromise ongoing investigations. I would indicate that it is important for the Intelligence Committee to have access to these documents in our oversight capacity. And if there is, uh, based upon those documents, a need for risk mitigation activities, the Intelligence Committee is obligated to oversee uh, those activities. I also would indicate that uh, prior leadership of the department was able to reach an accommodating circumstance with the Intelligence Committee during the Russia investigation, so there is precedent. Um, General, is it your position that the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence cannot have access to those classified documents recovered from the homes of uh, or offices of President Biden and Trump and Vice President Pence? Uh, Senator, I, I, I'm surprised to hear that the uh, DNI uh, used the word blocking. Um, I don't want to... Let me look and see if there's quotes or whether that's <laughs> my word. I would say we are working well with them. Um, we believe that there is an accommodation possible. Um, we've been trying to work towards an accommodation. Uh, we do have to balance the concerns of uh, ongoing criminal investigations. Uh, but we also well recognize the oversight responsibilities and obligations of the committee, uh, and we intend to work out an arrangement that will accommodate those interests. We've been working with the Office of the uh, uh, Director of National Intelligence uh, towards that. We've been making quite a bit of progress recently, uh, and we expect to make uh, further progress. Uh, I hope that that progress can occur. I appreciate your answer that suggests that it will occur and I hope it occurs in a timely fashion. I would indicate that the Intelligence Committee has no interest in uh, asking who, what, or when. Um, our interest is in oversight over the intelligence community. So I thank you for that answer. Let me turn to an experience I had about a week ago uh, in Mexico City. Uh, it was a Sunday before last. I met along with a number of my bipartisan and bicameral colleagues with President Lopez Obrador in Mexico, something you've done on several occasions. Um, I indicated to him that we had work to do in the United States on keeping guns from crossing the border going south, that we needed to do more to help prevent uh, and reduce the use of drugs in the United States. But if we, uh, as we pursued those um, plans of action, could the president, President Obador, do more to encourage and, in fact, insist, I hope the word I would use is demand, China, to uh, eliminate the precursor chemicals coming from China to Mexico before they then cross the border to the United States? He indicated he would formally 
request that China take action to reduce exportation of fentanyl precursors. Uh, I think that is a promising development. Uh, the fact remains that cooperation between our two countries on law enforcement matters are extremely important. They are also significantly strained. Uh, the Drug Enforcement Administration remains severely constrained in its operational capabilities in Mexico. Um, excuse me while I turn the page slowly. One of the most significant lessons for me during that, uh, uh, that trip to Mexico was just how critical it is that we work to improve coordination and cooperation on law enforcement matters. Your first foreign visit to the, uh, as U.S. Attorney was to Mexico. You visited again there just uh, about two and a half months ago. Yesterday, NBC News reported that we may be close to a major agreement with the government of Mexico to address both the flow of fentanyl and illegal firearms trafficking. General, what is your assessment of the state of U.S.-Mexico cooperation on law enforcement? Uh, can you provide me any information about such a, a potential or near agreement? And um, uh, I, I guess I'll follow up depending upon what your answers are. Yeah. Um, so uh, I can't really say about a, a pending agreement um, um, uh, about those discussions. Um, but I think I, I would uh, align myself with every single thing that you said uh, with respect to your visit to Mexico and, and your concerns. Uh, look, the way fentanyl in particular travels is it comes, uh, it begins with uh, precursor sales uh, from uh, China uh, to Mexico. Uh, in Mexico, um, it's made uh, into fentanyl, either uh, powder or pills, and crosses the border and then it's transmitted through our, our communities. Uh, the main runners are the uh, Jalisco um, uh, and the Sinaloa cartels. Uh, we need Mexico at every stage to act. We need Mexico to destroy the labs, uh, um, with, uh, with respect to which we've had some success. The last time I, I went to Mexico, right before I went, they destroyed major labs. Uh, we need them to crack down on the cartels. We need them uh, to crack down on the precursor uh, purchases of precursor chemicals by Mexican companies and the sales by the Chinese. Uh, likewise, we need to um, uh, 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 put as much pressure on China as we can uh, to not make those sales. Um, the Treasury Department uh, has recently uh, issued sanctions against some of the uh, precursor chemical um, uh, dealers in, Me in um, um, China. Um, we think that's a, a useful way um, to cut off some of that. And uh, I know that Treasury will be doing more in that respect. I also agree that uh, the United States has responsibilities to prevent the transshipment of arms from the United States to the cartels in Mexico. Uh, as, as we saw in a, in a very recent arrest of some of the cartel leaders, uh, the, uh, the Mexican military was almost outgunned um, by the uh, weaponry that the cartels now have. So I think I would align myself with everything that you've said. Uh, Mr. General, Attorney General, uh, thank you for your answer. My time has expired. If you need resources or tools that this committee can help provide, please let us know. And uh, I would ask you to specifically work to repair the relationship between uh, the Mexican government and the uh, DEA. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Moran. Um, we will now go to Senators Murray and then Collins, and then we will take other questioners in order of appearance. So, Senator Murray. Well, thank you very much, Chair Shaheen, and to Ranking Member Moran. I think everybody on this dais knows really well that uh, Senator Collins and I are returning this committee to regular order, and I couldn't ask for two better members to help steer this committee through, so thank you for the work you're doing to get that done. I think we all realize we have a responsibility to get these funding bills done in a time bipartisan way that really makes sure our country and our communities have the resources they need to keep people safe. It is no small task, and so I'm glad to have both of you partners in getting this done. And as I think this discussion today makes clear, keeping our families safe doesn't just mean having a strong military, obviously that's important, but it also means having a fair functioning system of justice and safe communities. We can't keep our families safe from threats like drug trafficking that is bringing the deadly fentanyl in or white supremacy and the uptick in hate crimes without investing in effective law enforcement. 
And as we saw yesterday with the devastating shooting in Nashville, um, I think it's all too clear we have to do more to protect our kids and our families and our communities from gun violence, which will require us to, of course, do more to strengthen our laws, but it also requires the resources we need to carry out the laws we already have on the books and keep guns away from violent criminals. And, you know, we have made some progress to support state red flag laws to protect survivors of domestic abuse, we have to do a lot better for women, and that includes in our indigenous communities where so many violent crimes against women have gone unsolved. I th this is something I'm really focused on, making sure that this unacceptable injustice on tribal lands is met with uh, strong work from, from our country now. And of course, we can't forget that we aren't protecting our families unless we're also supporting the Civil Rights Division in fighting against bigotry and discrimination. And we can't keep our democracy a democracy if we're not protecting Americans' most basic rights, the right to use your voice, the right to vote, and I also clearly mean the right for women in every corner of our country to get the health care. Uh, and family planning services that they need. So these are really important challenges, and to meet them, we need strong investments in the critical work of this subcommittee. So we've got a lot of work ahead of that. Um, uh, so Attorney General Gardland, thank you for being here. I do have a few questions. One of them on the, your budget was, I was really glad to see an increase in the Office for Violence Against Women. I have long advocated for improvements in VAWA grants, including the Special Tribal criminal jurisdiction so indigenous women and children and survivors can seek justice in our courts. I also authored and got signed into law legislation to make sure survivors of sexual assault can get medical exams when they need to be able to seek justice. So I wanted to ask you today, can you walk me through what your proposed budget does for investments in these critical areas? Right, so for the Office of Violence Against Women, um, we're asking for $1 billion, which is a $300 million increase over the previous enacted uh, appropriation. Uh, this includes what you just mentioned, uh, $20 million in a new program for access to sexual assault nurse exams. It includes $147 million for reducing the DNA um, um, backlog uh, for rape kits. Um, this includes um, both uh, Violence Against Women Act and Office of Justice Programs funds. Um, collecting DNA, forensic research, training, testing, includes uh, uh, money for the Debbie Smith DNA uh, backlog grant program. Then it includes $300 million, which is a $45 million uh, increase in grants to combat violence against women, uh, the so-called STOP Act. Um, $100 million for sexual assault services, which is a, uh, uh, a $21.5 million increase. That's for rape centers and for non-governmental organizations that provide crisis intervention and victim assistance. Uh, there's a legal assistance program of $95 million, which is a $40 million increase for civil legal aid for domestic violence and sexual um, assault victims and survivors. Uh, transitional housing for victims, uh, $95 million, which is a $45 million increase. Um, I think... I mean, okay. there are many more aspects of the program, but those I, are big numbers. I really appreciate that, and I appreciate the focus on that, and I think those are critical investments that we need to really strongly consider in this committee. Senator Moran asked you about fentanyl from sort of a policy perspective. Can I ask you, since this is something we're all concerned about, what is in the president's bu budget to address the opioid crisis? Yeah, so obviously there's two sides uh, of this, as, as, um, as you correctly said. Uh, one side is the uh, law enforcement side, and the other is our effort to deal with opioid addiction and uh, abuse uh, and uh, to make people whole and, and to help them survive. On the law enforcement side, we're asking for $10.4 billion, which is a $342.8 million increase for all of our law enforcement. So this includes DEA, um, um, both for its law enforcement agents and for diversion control, which has been a serious problem, obviously, with respect to the opioids. Marshal Service, uh, the FBI, which includes particular targeting of fentanyl and opioid trafficking on the dark web. Um, um, the, um, our, our Office of, um, or our Organized Crime and Drug Enforcement Task Force, uh, OCDEF, um, 550.5 million for their strike forces. 
the criminal division and the civil division, both of which uh, pro um, uh, provide law enforcement on both the criminal and the civil side, uh, and then grants uh, for the Bureau of Justice Assistance and the COPS for anti-heroin and anti-meth, and um, for the health and health care and fraud and abuse control. So we have uh, both the Appalachian uh, Regional, Regional uh, Opioid Task Force and the New England Regional um, Task Force, um, and we're asking for money for both of those. Okay, um, and, I, and my time is out, but I, well, I'll sorry. just say this to, to this committee as well, um, that w we all want to make sure that we're going, doing everything we can with the opioid crisis. We need to have a strong... Uh, budget capability to invest in these programs. They are a critical part of dealing with this crisis. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Murray. Senator Collins. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. T Attorney General, let me begin by telling you that I appreciate the work that you described to Senator Moran in working with the Mexican government to combat the very violent cartels that are smuggling drugs that are poisoning our children. In the state of Maine, a record 716 people lost their lives last year as a result of drug overdoses, and 80% of those deaths were linked to fentanyl. Nationwide, there were more overdose deaths last year than all homicides and traffic accidents, fatalities combined. So this is obviously a very serious problem. The Drug Enforcement Administration is the agency that is focused on disrupting the cartels and the trafficking networks that are flooding our country with fentanyl and poisoning our children for profit. And that's why I'm puzzled by the president's budget. In a year in which the president is requesting almost 1,200 new attorneys for the Department of Justice, that same budget only requests four new DEA special agents. And that does not seem to me to be commensurate with the challenges posed by the cartels and trafficking networks. To give you another example, and I'll make this the question, why is the department putting a greater focus on hiring 166 antitrust attorneys than special agents to interdict dangerous drugs? So, um I don't think, uh, if you compare the budget requests that we have for the antitrust division, I'm trying to get the number, but it's nowhere near what we're asking for DEA, which is $3.3 billion. Um, the total number of new agents is actually 131. Um, we, we got some money at the end of FY23. We haven't been able to hire the agents yet, so the total between FY23 and FY24 will be 131. But uh, we are also adding a total of 216 positions um, for uh, uh, drug fighting, including 50 diversion investigators and 35 intelligence analysts. So we have a substantial number of um, DEA ag agents, and we're looking at a, a, you know, a base of already of $3.3 billion. We're asking for a $171 million increase, a 5.5% increase in their overall ability um, to fight uh, narcotics, and this includes uh, an increase of $73 million for diversion control. Um, I, I feel deeply the same concern that you have about the consequences of fentanyl. Um, it is, as a DEA administrator points out, uh, uh, like playing Russian roulette if you get one of these pills, uh, six in 10 chance that it will kill you. Um, um, and the vicious cartels, which could care less about uh, their, quote, customers, that's why I've myself traveled uh, repeatedly to Mexico. That's why I continue to meet in the United States with uh, um, the Mexican senior uh, security uh, officials. That's why I've met with the Attorney General of Mexico three times. Um, and in each case, what we're trying to do is uh, energize them to battle the cartels, uh, energize them to help us extradite the leaders and to take down the networks, um, and energize them to take down the labs. Um, so I, I, I don't think that anybody who looks at the amount of money we're spending 
Um, overall, for DEA, could think we didn't care uh, about this issue. This is an uh, issue of enormous importance uh, to the country. And let me say that I know that you personally care deeply about this problem, but when I look at the budget, even though I realize we did authorize 121 new agents last year, I'm talking about this year's budget, and when I see just four new DEA agents, I realize there's some investigative agents that you are proposing, but it just seems like a real imbalance compared to the t almost 1,200 new attorneys. But let me move on to another issue where there are steep cuts in a number of important programs that have always enjoyed broad bipartisan support and that includes grants to support the NICS system to ensure efficient, effective background checks, grants to address the rape kit backlog, grants to support victims of trafficking. The budget even proposes a 60% grant cut to the Shepherd Bird Hate Crimes Prevention Act. And once again, perplexing to me, given that we're in the midst of this opioid crisis, the budget proposes cuts to drug treatment courts, veterans treatment courts, prescription drug monitoring programs, and residential substance abuse treatment programs. Uh, that's also on top of proposed cuts for the anti-meth task force and the regional information sharing services, the risk program. Uh, these are all critical programs that I've long supported. So it is very difficult for me to understand why the administration would propose cutting funds to help clear the rape kit back, backlog, to help veterans, to prevent hate crimes, and to address the opioid crisis. My request to you, Mr. Attorney General, is that you work with us and take a second look at these cuts. Um, it, these grant programs have always been bipartisan. They've been proven effective. And I would argue in many cases, we need them now more than ever. We would be very happy to work with you. I think some of the cuts are offset, offset by increases in other programs which have similar uh, objectives but I'd be very happy to have our uh, people work with yours. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Collins. Senator Schatz. Thank you, uh, Chair. Uh, Attorney General, thank you for being here. I want to start with the uh, enforcement of the Prison Rape Elimination Act. Uh, there was a recent report from the Bureau of Justice Statistics that showed more than 2,000 incidents of sexual harassment and misconduct by correction staff in federal facilities. What is the department doing to ensure that the Bureau of Prisons, corrections officers, and other staff members are taught from day one how to address and, more importantly, prevent PREA violations? Um, the uh, PREA is an extremely important act, and I know you had an important role in getting it uh, passed. Um, as you know, we have a new director of the Bureau of Prisons, and she has committed herself uh, to uh, focusing on this problem like a laser. She's establishing new uh, training programs in this area. Um, our Deputy Attorney General has set up a, um, uh, a working group to go over all the problems that have been discovered in a series of, um, of our own U.S. Attorney's Office and Inspector General investigations um, uh, to solve, uh, 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 to, to work on these problems. Uh, all, as you know, all the Bureau of Prisons facilities are audited every three years under PREA, and we get reports every year, so that's, that's how we know about uh, these problems. Um, um, but accountability is obviously another important factor here, and as I'm sure you know, last week on March 22nd, the former warden at FCI Dublin was sentenced to 70 months for multiple convictions involving sexual abusive conduct. Uh, and we have an, a quite aggressive effort uh, to root out uh, those uh, who are uh, uh, committing uh, criminal acts in abuse of their uh, positions of authority. Uh, so it's a combination of uh, increasing the training, 
uh, increasing the surveillance and then uh, increasing the punishment. Thank you. Um, Hawaii, as you know, has not had a federal halfway house since October of 2019. Since then, I've, re I've included report language in the CGS, uh, uh, CJS appropriations bill asking for an update. I have not received an update. Do you have one for me? Yeah, so I share your frustration over this problem of not being able to get a residential reentry center in Hawaii. And we do clearly need to find a way uh, to solve this problem. Uh, we have a team of, at BOP that has been particularly tasked uh, on this question. Uh, as you know, there have been multiple solicitations uh, for residential reentry um, in Hawaii, uh, which uh, have not been successful. This team is planning a, a trip to Hawaii in the near future uh, to talk with stakeholders about uh, what the problem is. Obviously, an important part of the problem has to do with uh, real estate and zoning issues in Hawaii. Um, but we can't wait until we get that. So at the same time, uh, we are working on uh, sort of almost workaround solutions. And one of those is to award a contract for a day reporting center in Hawaii. Uh, and we are hopeful that we are close uh, to being able to do that. We've closed the solicitation on that. Uh, and, and we're hopeful we'll be able to do that. that now, that does not meet the need for residential reentry. But it's, what, it's one thing that we can do in the meantime. Um, I, I'm, I'm grateful for your concern about this. This is certainly pushing us on this. Um, uh, and I'd offer when the Bureau of Prison team goes out to Hawaii, if you want to meet with them either before or after, I think uh, it would be uh, useful from both points of view. Please, uh, thank you. Um, let's talk a little bit about um, President Biden's executive order on police reform. Um, we've had some statutory changes as well as some executive orders around the 1033 and 1122 program. My specific question is when the department finds that state and local law enforcement agencies have engaged in a pattern of civil rights violations, what process does it fo follow to ensure that transferred equipment is returned to the federal government? So as you know, the uh, president's executive order um, prohibits uh, transfers of certain military type uh, equipment um, to law enforcement agencies. Uh, our own law enforcement agencies are in compliance. And from FY22, excuse me, onward, um, the Office of Justice Program grants have restrictions that prohibit the purchase or transfer of the, of the list of prohibited military type equipment. Um, from what I uh, understand, we have not yet encountered a situation where equipment uh, had to be returned uh, under a pattern or practice finding. The EO provides that if there is a pattern or practice uh, finding uh, for newly transferred equipment, it would have to be returned. Um, we made these restrictions clear to the law enforcement agencies in our grants, uh, but we do not yet have a circumstance where it's been required. Is there a regular um, a period of oversight or audits or is a pattern, pattern practice finding something that just happens episodically on a sort of case-by-case -case basis? Yeah, um, so um, I, I think the pattern of practice investigations, uh, as you no doubt you remember, we just opened one in Louisville. Um, we just, um, um, in the last few days, um, mostly resolved a, an older one in Seattle. Uh, we have them in a number of other uh, locations, um, but they are not routinely done across the country. They are where there's evidence um, uh, to provide a credible um, concern about pattern or practice with respect to a particular law enforcement agency. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Schatz. Senator Kennedy. Thank you. <clears throat> Madam Chair, thank you, General, for being here. Um, General, I want to ask you about the shooting at Covenant School, which is part of the Covenant Presbyterian Church. I, I realize that the shooter is dead, but the shooter could have had collaborators. Do you plan on, on opening a hate crime investigation for the targeting of Christians? The um, FBI and ATF are both uh, on the scene working with the um, uh, local police. Uh, as of now, motive hasn't been identified and the police chief said at the last, at his last press conference that they don't yet have reached a conclusion with respect to uh, motive. Uh, we are certainly working full time with them to try and determine what the motive is. And of course, motive is what determines whether it's a hate crime or not. Um, 
FBI Director Ray couldn't answer this at the time for reasons that are not his fault, but... Um, I hope you'll say the same thing if I can't answer it. Right <laughs> well, I think the coast is clear now. Um, Michael Sussman, you know who I'm talking about? Uh, he, he was a defendant in a special counsel uh, uh, prosecution. Case. Right, right. He was with the private law firm Perkins Coey, uh, which is the main counsel for the uh, National Democratic Party. He had a special badge to get him into the uh, Justice Department and or the FBI building. Why did he have that special badge? Uh, I'm afraid I also don't know anything about this. I assume uh, from um, the reference that this is something that Mr. Durham was investigating as part of his investigation. No, I don't think he investigated the badge. Uh, I know he was investigating Mr. Sussman. This goes back to, I think, 2020. Right. Um, but I don't, I don't know the answer to that. Okay. Could you find out for me? At the time, the, tri the, the, the trial was in progress, and Mr. Ray couldn't answer, but the trial's over. And I'd like to know why Mr. Sussman, a private citizen, had a special badge to get him into the FBI and the Department of Justice, and if there are other people out there who have special badges. Um, well, on, on the particular question about Sussman, I think we're going to have to wait until uh, Mr. Durham uh, finishes his report, which should be relatively soon. I certainly don't in any way want to interfere of course. with him, and he's the one who would know the answer to that. On the more general question, I can certainly ask my team to look into how lawyers have special badges. Would you? That'd be great. Thank you. I want to ask you about uh, the China Initiative. Uh, which, as you know, was started under the Department of Justice to counter the transfer of scientific research and intellectual property to, um, to China. Um, at any time, did the investigations initiated under the China Initiative uh, by the Department of Justice stem from racism? I have no evidence to suggest that they did. Okay. At any time, did the investigations pursuant to the China Initiative and begun by the Department of Justice, um, were they ever inappropriately undertaken? Again, I, I have no evidence to suggest that they did. Obviously, some of the cases resulted in acquittals or dismissals by court, but the courts, but that doesn't mean that they were uh, inappropriately begun. Okay. Um, did any of the cases that the department initiated under the China initiative um, um, reflect the ancestry of the defendant charged more than the seriousness of the allegations? I'm not a not sure exactly what you're asking, but it, it sounds like it's the same question, and I would give the same answer. I don't have any reason to believe that anything was in, done inappropriately or based on ancestry or based on discrimination in those cases. Okay. Do you agree with Chris Ray that China is the biggest threat to U.S. security? Yeah, I, uh, and I think the Director of National Intelligence also testified that it's our okay. uh, most dangerous uh, um, uh, near well, peer. Uh, well, let me ask you this, because I've got 11 seconds. I'm sorry? I've got 11 seconds left. Why did you get rid of the China Initiative then? Yeah, so um, as you know, um, the, uh, the new Assistant Attorney General uh, for the uh, National Security uh, uh, Division uh, gave a long description of what was done. Um, this was all folded into one uh, uh, nation state initiative. Uh, we don't know sometimes when there's a cyber attack, when there's another kind of attack, which country is attacking us. And I believe he thought it was most efficient for us to focus our attention on the four main uh, hostile uh, state actors, China now in, in, in many ways uh, affiliating with Russia. Which S some of your people said it was racist. I, I, I didn't say that. I don't know who my people are who said that. Okay. Well, if I had more time, I, we, can, we can find out here. <laughs> Help me out, Senator Manchin. <laughs> um, Senator Kennedy, there will be a second round of yes, questions if yes, you would like to stay. Yes, ma'am. Senator Manchin. There's no way I could fill in for you, sir. <laughs> uh, I, don't, I don't know whether that's good or that's bad. That's a good one. That's a good one. 
Uh, General Garland, thank you for your service. I really appreciate all the wonderful service you've given our country. Uh, I'd like to say first about West Virginia, you know, we've had, we're home to NASA, to the Customs and Border Protection Bureau of Fiscal Services. We have the CGIS FBI Center. The people there are concerned, they're hearing rumors there's going to be some cutbacks and movement of personnel in CGIS. If you could check that out, that's been tremendously, uh, I understand, tre tremendously effective agency that's been working there. And uh, uh, Director Gray has just come down and spent some time there. We went together through it. And all of a sudden, we've heard that uh, the CGIS may have some loss of jobs or transfer of jobs. And the people are they're hearing these rumors. So if you could help me relieve them of that fear, it would be very much appreciated. Also, the Hazleton prison we have in the prison system, Hazleton, has had some violent crimes there, but they're having a tremendous problem with shortages of uh, personnel. And there's a law, and we, we've directed money to be spent there, and it's been in your budget. But for some reason, they're not able to either find employees that will want to work there or the environment or whatever it may be. And I would hope that you would look into that personally because that's been a very important system for the Bureau of Prisons, but it's been very troubled. Yeah, this, this question um, of uh, retention uh, and hiring has been a big problem in all the prisons. And as I mentioned, we, are, we have a, um, a new program, which we worked out with the Office of Personnel Management to allow us to provide incentives for retention and hiring. Of well, we need is a maximum security thing, and it's, it's, they get some pretty, rough, for, some pretty rough characters come through there. And uh, I, uh, I, I meet with the staff quite frequently, and they have very much concerns. They'd love to have your attention and your help. Um, the drug epidemic, I can't speak enough about the problems. We're ground zero as West Virginia. And in that situation, that scenario we have, we know, as you said, the precursors are coming from China. Is there no way that we can do anything to stop that or have China be responsible, knowing that it's been going into the cartels for the manufacturing of fentanyl? Uh, we know what's happening. And is there any chance that all the United States government can just say, hey, enough's enough? I mean, uh, we've lost more people to these overdoses in any war we've ever fought. And to sit back and do nothing, can we spend special ops, special forces to match up with the uh, uh, with the Mexican government, if they have a determination to do something? If not, can we, for the benefit of America, do it on our own? Can we go in there, take care of, of the problem, and root it out if they're not going to do it? Uh, well, let me just start with the uh, drug problems in West Virginia. As I, I, I hope uh, you were advised, we just um, arrested uh, organizations. It was a big, it's a very largest, big, yeah. Yeah, the largest methamphetamine seizure in West Virginia history. You, uh, well over 200 pounds. You have a good man there, U.S. Attorney Will Thompson. He used to be a federal judge, I and mean, he's just a wonderful person, yeah. right person, did a heck of a job. So we're doing the right thing yes, in you West are. Virginia. And we've got There'll be a lot more to do. We've got to stop the flow of the drugs coming uh, absolutely. in. Absolutely. And I think that one of the things we have to do with respect to the precursors are to uh, identify and then sanction the um, uh, uh, manufacturers in China and then interdict. But quickly, is there anything we can do with China suppliers and also the producers down in Mexico and take it upon ourselves to go after Mexican cartels if the Mexican government won't do it? Well, I'm going to leave that question to the diplomats in the Defense Department. Uh, okay. As far as we're concerned, the DEA is working with them, um, trying to encourage them to work more together uh, with respect to uh, tackling the cartels. This is a whole of government yeah. effort. We just sent the Deputy Attorney gotcha. General, uh, the Deputy of the Homeland Security, uh, the Deputy National Security Advisor, all just went down again to Mexico to meet with uh, um, uh, the president sure. and their security ministers uh, to try to my, encourage them more on these joint yeah. operations. My final question, sir, is concerning Ukraine, and I know you just made a visit there. I've called that the most just war that we've ever been in in my lifetime because we're there for the right reason, trying to defend the freedoms and democracies that these countries desire when they have these unwanted attacks and this, this absolute horrific attack by uh, Putin. Um, can you discuss the department's work to hold a Russian accountable for the war crimes committed? Can you also provide an updated department's klepto capture work to seize illicit, drug, illicit Russian assets for the benefit of the Ukrainian people? And then finally, uh, they've made, I understand Ukraine's made tremendous progress in tackling their corruption uh, within its society, which has been systemic. Uh, can you discuss some of the progress that's been made? So yeah. first, I guess you could start with, if you can, the Russian war crimes. 
Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll get you the numbers separately so sure. as to not to take the time, but uh, the purpose of this visit of mine uh, was to meet with President Zelensky and with the Prosecutor General, as well as the Prosecutor Generals of all the surrounding countries, all of whom are participating in uh, war crimes investigations. The Prosecutor General has some 40,000 war crimes already registered. Uh, the Justice Department is providing forensic help on the ground in Ukraine to evaluate uh, the, the crime scenes. Uh, we, we're about to put a uh, prosecutor uh, embedded with the Prosecutor General in Kyiv. Um, we have stood up a um, uh, IT for them using some of what we learned in our various big case, digital case investigations here because everybody in Ukraine has an, an iPhone and there's a, millions and millions of di digital images of these war crimes as they were occurring. So we're, we're putting that all together. Um, we are supporting um, efforts in The Hague um, um, for a tribunal uh, that will be capable of um, uh, trying the war criminals. Um, and I've assigned Eli Rosenbaum, who is the head of our Nazi uh, hunting org, uh, um, entity in the Justice Department, to lead uh, what we call our War Crimes Accountability uh, Task Force. So that's on, on that side. Um, on the um, klepto capture, um, again, here I met again with a number of the justice ministers when I was in Ukraine. Uh, is my second visit. Um, and here we are uh, in enormous agreement among the EU countries uh, to, to uh, locate, uh, freeze, and seize the assets of R Russian oligarchs um, who are facilitating this uh, unlawful and unprovoked attack. Um, we have been quite successful um, in the amount of money that we've seized, um, and I've already um, uh, certified a transfer of some of that money to Ukraine, Ukraine for rebuilding, which is the first time we've ever been able to do that kind of forfeiture. On the uh, corruption uh, front, I, I've spoken heart-to-heart -heart with the Prosecutor General along with our uh, ambassador. Uh, we've gotten um, made clear to them that our own willingness to continue to provide funds depends on them being sure that the funds go to what they should be going to and that uh, uh, to not be used uh, uh, with respect to corruption. Um, this is also a, uh, uh, a condition for uh, ultimate admission to the EU. They are seized with this. Um, uh, they are very concerned to be sure that they eliminate that issue. And as you probably know about, maybe a month before I went to Ukraine, they arrested quite a number of high-level yeah. uh, Ukrainian officials on that guard. We'll get you more information on the specifics, of, for example. Thank you, sir. I'm so sorry, Madam Chairman. Thank you, Senator Manchin. Um, the second vote has been called for anyone who um, wants to go vote. I am going to go vote. I'm going to turn the gavel over to Senator Peters. And Senator Britt, you're next. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Uh, thank you, Mr. General, for being in front of us today. I appreciate the topics that have been brought up from drug cartels to Mexico and the DEA to the fentanyl poisoning communities all across this nation to drug use and addiction. I stand ready to be a productive part of those conversations and work to move our nation for forward, keeping our communities safe and strong. Mr. General, I want to ask you about some questions when you testified in front of the Senate Judiciary Committee a couple of weeks ago. I am um, a big believer, and I've heard this all over the state of Alabama as I've traveled, people want justice to be blind. They believe that is a foundational building block of our nation, and until we restore that trust and confidence, um, you know, people are, are worried about the direction our nation will go. So you testified several weeks ago before the Senate Judiciary Committee and fielded a number of questions from committee members regarding DOJ's failure to prosecute any individuals who were involved in the illegal protest outside the homes of multiple Supreme Court justices in the aftermath of the leaked Dobbs opinion. As you are well aware, 18 U.S.C. 1507 makes it a crime to picket or parade near a residence occupied by a judge. It says, with the intent of influencing any judge, juror, witness, or court officer in the discharge of his duty. In answering the questions from multiple members of the committee, you repeatedly asserted that DOJ's failure to bring any charges under Section 1507 was due to the fact that the U.S. Marshals who were protecting the homes of the justices failed to make any arrest under that statute. 
You said, quote, the marshals have been advised and they know, and the marshals on the ground, they have full authority to arrest people under any federal statute, including that federal statute, end quote. That was in direct reference to section 1507. You went on to say, the attorney general does not decide whether to arrest the marshals on the scene. They do make the decision of whether to arrest. After your appearance before the Judiciary Committee, we obtained copies of the slide deck that was used to train and prepare the marshals for their protective detail at the homes of the justices. Those training materials show that the marshals likely didn't make any arrest under Section 1507 for a pretty simple reason. They were actively discouraged from doing so. As you can see on the slide behind me, the marshals were explicitly told to avoid, unless absolutely necessary, any criminal enforcement action involving the protester. The slides went on to say, they explicitly state that making arrest and initiating prosecutions was not the goal of the marshal's presence at the homes of the justices, and the not was actually italicized and underlined. The next slide directs the marshals not to engage in protest-related enforcement actions beyond those that were strictly and immediately necessary and tailored to ensure the physical security of the justices. If you'll see in the next slide here, it discourages the marshals from making arrest under any section 1507 by asserting that there may be a First Amendment right to harass the families of the judges and by concluding that any arrest of protesters are a last resort to prevent physical harm of the justices. Mr. Attorney General, yes or no, were you at any point before your testimony in front of the Judiciary Committee aware of these training materials or the fact that the marshals had been heavily discouraged from making arrest under Section 1505? I think this is the first time I've seen this slide deck, and frankly, from here, I can't make it out, uh, for which I apologize for my eyesight, but I can't, can't make it out. Um, what I said uh, before was correct there, First and principal job is to protect the lives and property of the of the um, of the um, members of the court. Um, and as I said at the time, um, first attorney general has ever ordered the marshals to protect the residences uh, of the justices and to protect them 24/7. Yes. Uh, that's their principal responsibility. Uh, but that doesn't mean that that uh, other that uh, they are in any way precluded from. Um, uh, bringing other kinds of arrests. So right. thank you so much, Mr. Attorney General. I do have another question for in a few moments, but when you say they were given the full authority to arrest people violating Section 1507, I would ask, will you take a look at these slides, these materials, dig into them? It is clear that these marshals were given directives that limited, that narrowed the scope. Of course, we all want the physical safety, um, the physical safety of our Supreme Court justice is paramount, and we thank you for sending those marshals there. 1507, though, actually is more all-encompassing than that narrowly tailored, objective, uh, narrowly tailored objective, and it says picketing or parading near a building or housing. If you're doing it with the intent to interfere with, obstruct, or impede the administration of justice or influencing any judge in the discharge of his duty. It's clear when you look at these slides that the marshals were not given those directives. I would like for you to take a look at that. And if you agree with that statement, um, I'd like for you to amend your testimony to the Judiciary Committee. Well, I, I, there's nothing for me to amend because, I've, as I said, I've never seen those slides before. I d I know I need to yield my time. Um, it's clear the marshals were given a different directive, and I would ask you to look into that, please. I will. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Senator Britt. Attorney General Garland, good to see you here uh, today, and uh, thank you uh, for your service uh, to, to our country. As you know, uh, uh, many communities across the country, including my state of Michigan, are facing both a law enforcement uh, recruitment uh, challenge uh, and, in some cases, a trust uh, crisis as well. The uh, Strong Communities Act legislation, uh, which I led, uh, aims to help facilitate improved relationships between law enforcement and the communities that they are entrusted uh, to serve. The legislation would allow grants under the Department of Justice's Community-Oriented Policing Services Grant Program to be used for officers and recruits to attend law enforcement training programs, so long as officers and recruits uh, agree to work for the law enforcement agencies uh, in their communities for a set period of time. 
And by recruiting uh, from within these communities, the, uh, these recruits will know the people they are working uh, to protect. Uh, the bill would thus help build stronger relationships between local law enforcement and uh, the neighborhoods uh, uh, that they serve. It would also incentivize people to serve in law enforcement in the communities which they call home each and every day. The legislation has been endorsed by both civil rights and law enforcement groups, including the uh, NAACP uh, and the Fraternal Order of Police. So my, my question for you, Attorney General Garland, is could, could you speak to the importance of community policing and how recruiting from within communities themselves can help build trust between officers uh, and communities? And perhaps more generally, could you address the importance of adequate funding for the COPS office and the grant program uh, that it administers? Well, let me uh, start even more specifically. Uh, we are support supporters of your Strong Communities Act. Um, we think it's a very good idea, and it will allow our COPS grants um, to go for this, for this purpose. Um, so that's very specific. Uh, and slightly broader on the uh, appropriations side, um, we've, uh, in, in the budget is a request for a new gun crime uh, prevention strategic fund of uh, $884 million for FY24, uh, $4.4 billion over five years. This would be grants for state and local law enforcement to address locally driven needs, but it would include hiring, recruitment, retention, training, and wellness. I don't know if it's specifically focused on what you're interested in, specifically interested in, which is hiring from the communities, but we think that's a, a very good idea. Um, we think that an important element of our fight against violent crime is the relationship between the communities and the police. We need uh, federal government to be all playing together. We need the federal government to be in good partnership with the state and local uh, law enforcement, and then we need state and local law enforcement and federal government to be close to their communities. That's the way in which we get trust. That's the way in which we get witnesses. That's uh, the way in which we get tips with respect to violent crime. Well, thank you. You know, the, the Department of Justice uh, has said that the greatest terrorism threat to Americans uh, is from domestic uh, terrorism, and specifically white supremacist and uh, anti-government uh, extremists. Congress required uh, DHS uh, and the FBI uh, in the FY20 NDAA to provide us uh, with information about all forms of uh, domestic terrorism, as well as how they are defining uh, and uh, resourcing uh, this significant threat. But despite the, the requirement uh, in the NDAA uh, under federal law, uh, these agencies have failed to provide all of this information. In fact, a recent GAO report found that the FBI uh, was not aware that the DHS was producing domestic terrorism data, which was one of the several reasons uh, that data uh, in the past two reports uh, was simply uh, incomplete. So Attorney General Garland, my question for you, sir, is could, could you tell us specifically how your department is resourcing uh, this threat of domestic terrorism? And can you elaborate on your confidence that the department is adequately prepared for this threat uh, and uh, hope to get your commitment that we will get this uh, data as required by law, but perhaps generally about uh, resources for domestic terrorism? Well, on the la just on, to start on the latter point, I wasn't aware of the GAO study, and uh, uh, my understanding was that the FBI and DHS published a joint strategic intelligence assessment uh, on data on domestic terrorism in May of 2021 for FY19 and an updated report in October 22, uh, 2022 for FY20 and FY21. There's no doubt that the department had failed in the past to keep this up to date, but I think <laughs> I think we're up. Do we need to continue, please? Um, I think I think we're up to date now. Um, but if there's uh, information lacking, if well, that's the, that's the question. We'll follow up with your office. That, uh, it that, wasn't uh, that a report was produced that uh, did not adequately cover the uh, the topic. All right. So on that, it would be helpful if, if we we will do that. I would hope to get your commitment that we could work with your office to, to work with uh, the FBI to make sure that uh, the information that was requested all in its entirety is provided. Yeah, absolutely. And on the uh, counterterrorism front, um, um, we're asking for more than $1.6 billion, which is an increase in 10.6% for our counterterrorism efforts. This extends to the National Security Division, the FBI, uh, and the ATF, and it covers both uh, foreign terrorism, uh, foreign-based uh, terrorism in the United States, um, and uh, domestic terrorism. Great. Thank you. Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Peters and Senator Haggerty. 
You were not here when the Attorney General and I both and Senator Moran all expressed our condolences to I, the families affected and the, the people of Tennessee. I certainly heard the comments, uh, Chair, and I very much appreciate that. And likewise, General Garland, I appreciate the conversation that I had with you yesterday and your opening remarks today and the sympathies that you conveyed. Uh, this is an unspeakable act of evil. And uh, it, it is a depraved murderer's gruesome actions that have led to the deaths of three nine-year-old children and three adults in my hometown and my home state of Nashville, Tennessee. I join my friends, the families there, the communities in mourning for the victims, for their families, for the Covenant Church community, and, and for the city of Nashville and the state of Tennessee. Um, and I appreciate the outpouring of condolences that have come from every direction. I'd also like to take the opportunity to, to speak to the bravery and the heroism of the Nashville Police Department. I know you've been in contact with the police chief, uh, General Garland. Um, the Nashville police and the other first responders were there almost instantaneously. My wife, in fact, was in traffic. As the sirens went by, she pulled over. She could tell that the massive amount of resources were being deployed. And in just minutes, these officers stepped into the fray, incurred massive risk with shots coming at them. And I specifically want to acknowledge officers Rex Engelbert and Officer Michael Colasio and all their fellow officers who willingly ran toward danger and put their lives at risk to bring the situation uh, to, to, uh, to resolution. It's a very complex set of circumstances, and the families there not only deserve the full resources of the Department of Justice to find out what happened, but transparency about what happened and why. We've got to do everything we can to prevent a tragedy like this from, prevent a tragedy like this from happening again. Nashville Police Chief John Drake has said that the killer had a manifesto and other writings that indicated deeply disturbing motives, as well as plans for another attack. This, of course, is extremely alarming. My immediate focus is on the families affected, but I also wanted to ask you a few questions, General Garland, that are on the mind of Tennesseans. Um, first, General Garland, you mentioned in your testimony that the FBI and the ATF are involved. But can you walk me through the department's response and involvement in the investigation at this point? Yeah, so um, basically the ATF office just emptied out. Everybody uh, in that office uh, ran to the scene. Uh, they uh, and, and the FBI did as well. Um, the, the, the first job, of course, for ATF is to uh, try and trace the guns uh, from the serial numbers as soon as they could get them, uh, find out where they were purchased, et cetera. Uh, and uh, the FBI is now working with the uh, um, uh, uh, Nashville police to, uh, to, to determine motive. And, and that includes uh, all the normal ways that you would think, going through social media, um, going through uh, what was recovered from the search of the house, mm -hmm. of, of that sort of thing. But they will stick with this as long as it takes. Well, uh, thank you. As I said, my immediate focus is the victims and their families, but transparency is important too. And the facts that are being reported by local law enforcement regarding the killer are very disturbing. Law enforcement officials have indicated that the killer may have been motivated by, motivated by deeply disturbing beliefs. And you responded, of course, to Senator Kennedy just a few minutes ago that the motive is not yet known. But if the evidence suggests that the killer's motives were political or ideological, I just want to confirm with you that part of your investigation will be to determine whether this constitutes a hate crime or domestic terrorism? Yes, uh, uh, a motive that uh, 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 is based on the religion um, or the political ideology of the victims is a hate crime. Thank uh, you very much for confirming that, General Garland. I appreciate that. And I, I also say that um, this is a terrible tragedy that no community should ever have to endure. And again, I appreciate your continued focus on it, making certain that all the resources of the DOJ are deployed and, and that we leave no, one, no stone unturned here. And thank you for keeping me up to date on that. You have our promise on that. Thank you very much, General. Thank you, Senator Haggerty. Senator Van Hollen. Um, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, welcome, Mr. Attorney General. Thank you and your team for your service uh, to our country. I know we're looking at the coming year's budget, fiscal year 24, but I just want to say a few words about the fiscal year 23 uh, budget, uh, where uh, this committee uh, helped provide an increase uh, to DOJ, um, including the federal law enforcement U.S. attorneys receiving a 6% increase in salaries and expenses funding 
to enable the department to hire new agents, deputy marshals, correction officers, and attorneys, as well as increase and expand existing investigative technical capabilities. Um, I read that report language uh, from last year, Mr. Attorney General, because we in Maryland are in urgent need of additional help, uh, especially in the U.S. Attorney's Office. Uh, we have U.S. Attorney Eric Barron, who's doing a really good job. But Baltimore City uh, is experiencing a real crisis when it comes to public safety and violent crime. Uh, everyone is trying to urgently address it from the local level to the state level. And we are appreciative of the steps the federal government, you and your office have taken, but we do need additional help. Uh, Senator Cardin and I had a very positive uh, comment, uh, discussion uh, with the Deputy Attorney General, uh, Monica, uh, just a few weeks ago and sent a follow-up letter. But Mr. Attorney General, we desperately need uh, additional resources for the U.S. Attorney's Office. Uh, in Maryland. I just want your assurance that you'll do everything you can to work with us to try to find those resources. Yes, uh, as you know from the conversation with the Deputy Attorney General, um, uh, we're currently um, reviewing the allocations from the FY23 budget for U.S. Attorney's offices, and uh, we will continue to work with you on this question. We appreciate that. I, I remember the, the previous year, Senator Cardin and I had a similar conversation with the Deputy Attorney General, and she said that because we had not provided enough resources uh, to accommodate it, we weren't able to, to get that. So that's what, one of the reasons we joined with our colleagues to make sure we upped uh, that, that amount of resources. Uh, for it that, is true for in that the previous purpose. year we were completely flat. No, it's true, I understand that, and that was the response we got. But in response to getting that answer, we worked very hard to increase uh, the budget for these purposes. Um, I, I do wanna talk for a moment about the issue of gun violence, and I apologize, I was in other hearings, so I don't know to what extent that's been covered. I did hear Senator Haggerty uh, talk about the terrible, terrible uh, shooting uh, in, in Tennessee. Uh, and I appreciate the President's uh, underscoring the importance of needing Congress to move forward uh, on things like a ban on semi-automatic assault weapons, uh, but my questions are gonna be focused on other measures that we, you've taken and some more that we can take. First of all, I, I do want to applaud you and the President uh, for moving forward on executive orders on ghost guns. Uh, I've you know, heard from the Mayor of Baltimore, I've spoken to him many times, uh, more and more the guns that are turning up at crime scenes are ghost guns. So we are playing catch up when it comes to ghost guns, but appreciate uh, the efforts uh, that you and the administration have taken in that regard, as well as the more recent executive order uh, in defining uh, more clearly what it means to be a fire firearms dealer. Uh, and look forward to working with you and your team to really enforce both those executive orders because this is a, a the issue of ghost guns is, is, is a big problem. And the, ex ex the qu question of who is at arms um, uh, a, a, a firearms dealer has also been a big issue and a contributor to the problem of ghost guns, among other things. Um, I, I wanted to ask you about what have been called the T-Hard Amendments, right? These are restrictions that have been embedded in appropriation bills over years by former Congressman T-Hart, who has since uh, he retired from Congress or renounced his own work. Um, but. Uh, could you just talk for a moment about how those restrictions in law handcuff the ability of the ATF to more quickly trace guns used in crime and make it harder for them to do their job enforcing existing laws that are on the books? Well, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm hating to admit this. Uh, the part of the T. Hart amendments that I do know about are the disclosure of the individual names of FFLs. Um, I'm not really sure of how it limits our ability to do tracing, um, so I'll have to get back to you on that. I would appreciate that because we are this. We we this is a pretty common sense bill. I've introduced it. It's called the ATF Modernization Act, and uh, what it does is simply make it easier for the ATF to do its job by removing limitations that were put in place and remain embedded uh, in appropriation bills uh, that simply are designed to make it harder for them to trace uh, guns used in crime or have the practical effect of doing that. So we look forward to getting your, your input on that. Thank you, Madam Chair. 
Thank you, Senator Van Hollen. I, I have a few more questions before we close the hearing. I, I want to begin with the Crime Victims Fund because we saw that the VOCA fix has had um, has been helpful in addressing some of the reductions in the Crime Victims Fund over the last several years, but deposits are still substantially lower than their average annual average between fiscal years 2007 and 2017. So my, question, my first question is, does the department think there are any larger settlements that are in the pipeline? And secondly, um, earlier this year, the Justice Department announced revisions to the Criminal Division's corporate enforcement policy which provides additional incentives to companies for voluntary self-disclosures, and among those incentives is a potential reduction, at least 50% and up to 75% of the company's criminal fine. Um, is the department concerned about the potential impact this new policy might have on the Crime Victims Fund? So to, uh, to take the second question first, uh, I think our view about that is that we are more likely uh, to get money uh, and settlement and penalties um, through this new policy because it will alert us to violations we would not otherwise know about. So, of course, if we knew about them, this would have been a discount, but this is only where we didn't know about them. So we think the consequence is likely to be that we will get more money um, and more penalties. People will come in and basically self-surrender, and that will be very helpful. On the um, uh, question of the VOCA fix, at least my understanding is that um, in FY22, uh, we got um, uh, $48 million more than in the previous year, an increase in 6% of deposits thanks to the fix. But this year, we're doing even way better than that. So in the first four months, um, um, uh, 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 an increase of $408 million over the previous year, which is um, an increase of 321% over the previous year. So. The predictions from our Justice Management Division are that the amount of money that we've asked to take from the fund, the $1.2 billion, we will be able to replace that by the end of the year. Of course, that's only an estimate, um, but that's our current estimate that, uh, that, that we should be able to continue to do that. Well, that's very encouraging, and I think we would agree that the VOCA fix is, is working. Um, what was not clear to us is the extent to which we have an assessment of how much money that might bring in over the remainder of this year. And so if you have any of those, um, any of that analysis that you can share with us, we'd appreciate I'll that. I'll ask our budget people to talk to your team um, to get uh, more explanation of uh, how it is, we, why it is we think we'll get that estimate. Great, that's, that's very helpful. Um, earlier this month, before the Senate Judiciary Committee, you talked about the 24-7 protection that's provided by the U.S. Marshal Service for the Supreme Court justices and their families. Can you share with us the resources that are necessary for this 24-7 um, protection and how long you expect that to continue? Do you expect to see it continue indefinitely? And do you think we need to take legislative action to address how we deal with that protection long term? So I'll have to get you the exact numbers for, uh, for that. Um, we are asking for um, an increase specifically for judicial security for, to, hire, to be able to increase by 42 uh, deputy U.S. Marshals, uh, $21 million um, in the, uh, out, of all, out of the total that we're, that we're asking for for the Marshals. Um, Congress authorized last year the um, Supreme Court police uh, to provide that protection. Uh, I don't know whether it's appropriated the money for um, them to do that, and this is a task we would happily turn over to the, to the Supreme Court police. So I don't think, I mean, we're hoping this isn't a long-term um, solution for, for, uh, for the justices because there are a lot of courts around the country, as you can imagine, and the marshals have judicial security responsibilities right. uh, not to say nothing of their fugitive apprehension um, uh, responsibilities. Good. So. You're, you're not anticipating this to go on long-term then? We're hoping that it doesn't go on long-term, yes. Okay. Um, I also wanted to ask you about the immigration court's case mm -hmm. backlogs, which I think we all agree um, we need to find a way to address. I think the ultimate way to do that is with comprehensive immigration reform. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the things we are going to need are more immigration judge teams. But I I'm concerned that while we have increased the number of immigration judges, 
over that same period, um, we've seen the backlog increase as well. And it suggests that that may not be the answer that we were hoping for. And I wondered if you could speak to the potential to address um, the getting rid of some of the paper um, records and digitizing court records and modernizing case management systems and why that isn't also part of that request. Yeah, so, so it is. Um, uh, with respect to staffing, we're asking for uh, enough money for 965 new staff for the judges, which, le which uh, results in a, with 150 new uh, immigration judge teams. Um, and then we would be placing them in the most uh, areas of the highest uh, uh, number of cases. And um, th then we would also um, have, we have a backlog initiative, a backlog reduction initiative uh, for an increase of $367.1 million for that. And that's the technology that you're talking about. So we want to provide, to expand our virtual hearings uh, procedures particularly so that we can have hearings at the border, virtually uh, at the border, um, uh, more of, of, of this new system we call dedicated dockets, which is a pilot program to, to resolve the entire matters within 300 days. Uh, we have the new um, asylum officer rule, um, which uh, puts the first decision um, by um, DHS asylum officers um, at the border um, and, uh, and then reduces the IJ review, and we expect that to reduce it from four years to as little as six months. So um, uh, you're right that uh, the backlog has gone up. It has not gone down, um, and we're trying to face this through the increased hiring and the uh, backlog reduction initiative. Um, but of course, this is on the back end. The front end is the number of people coming uh, to the border. Well, I look forward to hearing more about the the program at the border, the pilot, because I think we've got to figure out some way to address this problem long term. Um, my final question has to do with anomalous health incidents, which I have um, been working on for a number of years. And I know that there are, um, we are trying and I think are doing better in terms of addressing the impact on victims across the federal government. Um, but there are a handful of FBI employees and family members who have been affected by AHIs that require treatment for their injuries, and um, the FBI has indicated to us that they can't implement the draft rule, which is required to address the benefits until Maine Justice approves the language, um, and consequently, there are people who have been affected who are still waiting for some relief. So. Can I have your commitment that this is something that you'll try and get done in the immediate future? Yes, absolutely. It was only March 1st that the FBI put in place the, the, the system, and now we have to have regulations that endorse it. Right. Um, but I uh, totally agree this needs to be sped up. These people should not be suffering without financial assistance. Thank you. Well, I think the FBI has been slow to... to well, I'm not pointing fingers anywhere. <laughs> you're, you are not. I am. Um, but... That's fine. Um, Senator Merkley has arrived, so I don't know, um, Mr. Attorney General, if you would like a break or you want to go ahead and um, I'm happy to go forward. It is, if this is getting near a break, this is, I can certainly OK. I, hopefully, this will be the last questioner, Senator Merkley. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, and thank you uh, for your, your service and for your testimony. I just came from a, a rally outside for a bill that's supported by Democrats and Republicans of, of both houses uh, to promote a peaceful resolution of the conflict between Tibet and, and China. It has now been uh, 13 years uh, since China was willing to sit down and hold a, a discussion. And um, in the hearing we held earlier this morning on the uh, oppression of Tibet, one of the folks who was testifying uh, made a request, a request that is parallel to a request I've been making of the FBI. And uh, his request was specifically for a hotline dedicated to transnational repression. And before, when I have raised this before, the, essentially the pressure that China and other countries uh, 
put on both American citizens and residents here and essentially threaten their families back home or in otherwise seek to suppress their freedom of, of speech on, on world issues. When I've raised it before, the FBI said, well, just you know, have folks call the tip line at the FBI. It's, it's very clear that, that folks are so aware of the extensive ability of the Chinese to track our phones, to um, crack uh, databases and so forth, that they're not going to call a tip line of de dedicated just general criminal purposes to share that they have been, uh, well, um, blackmailed, if you will, uh, by Chinese authorities. Somebody walking up and saying, we know who your family is that lives in such and such, and you know your sister's at, at risk, or maybe a family member might disappear if you continue to be an activist on this topic. Um, it was uh, uh, folks today from uh, Tibet, uh, but it could have been a, a testimony by, by Uyghur folks or other folks who are feeling the transnational repression from around uh, the world. For people to be able to call and kind of share their story will give us some sense of the broad scope of this growing strategy in the, in the world because we only see just the tiny uh, tip of it. And, um, but people have to have confidence, uh, confidence in the integrity of... Uh, the capability, the language capability, the confidentiality, the uh, security uh, of the uh, databases and so forth. All of this means uh, it makes a lot of sense if we're serious about transnational repression to have a special dedicated team and a special dedicated portal through which people can, can approach and share their stories so we can start to understand the full scope of the problem and the best ways to push back and, and protect the freedoms of uh, American residents and American citizens. So simply, my question is, uh, uh, I, I realize you may not, this may not have been something that has brought to your attention before, so you may not have an opinion on it, but will you take the time to explore this question? And if you reach the same conclusion that many of us have reached, that if we're really going to take on transnational repression, we need to have a much better team dedicated to it and a much better portal to work with people in the United States. If you reach that conclusion, will you help us establish that team? Uh, yes, um, I'd be happy to have uh, our team uh, work with yours. Um, I, I'm not sure about the practicalities of how this portal would work, and I think that's something that would need to be discussed. Um, the FBI and the uh, National Security Division are very concerned about transnational repression, particularly um, uh, by intimidation by the People's Republic of China. We've already brought uh, several cases in that respect. We have other investigations going on that way. Um, for whatever it's worth, when I was a judge, I personally uh, visited Tibet, um, and I saw the kind of um, um, uh, way in which the Tibetan culture is being um, um, uh, modified and uh, the, uh, uh, repressed there. So um, we would be happy to work with you on this, but I want you to, to be sure uh, of our view that uh, this kind of repression, particularly coming uh, and transnational intimidation coming from China, is a very high concern of ours. Well, I uh, appreciate that, that sentiment. And I'll just reiterate that from those who are within the communities being affected, they do not feel they have a safe way to communicate with the U.S. government about this very serious uh, ch challenge. And if you don't feel safe, you don't communicate. So we only get just a small veneer of the, 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 the problem. And I think it is a very big deal as a country that believes in freedom of expression, freedom of assembly. We have a lot of residents and citizens who do not feel they have freedom of speech and freedom of expression because of this intimidation. And I really appreciate your partnership and your help on this. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Merkley. If there are no further questions this afternoon, senators may submit additional questions for the record. Um, we request the Department of Justice's responses within 30 days. And the committee stands in recess until Tuesday, April 18th, when we will hold a hearing with NASA and the National Science Foundation. Thank you, Attorney General Garland. Thank you.